Hi, welcome to Medical and Applied Entomology Lecture 2. If you may have noticed from my splash screen, you know we have mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are the worst insects on a planet by far in terms of disease transmission to humans. Uh, but today we're going to cover a different group of flies that um, cause a lot of trouble, but we've had incredible success in managing and controlling populations. And in Florida in particular, this has been a, an incredible success story of medical entomology. Uh, the eradication of some of the most uh, gruesome, awful flies on the planet. And so today I'm going to cover a few things. I'm going to cover uh, terminology associated with uh, fly infections. I'm going to highlight Again, one of the celebrated examples of eradication of flies, um, a celebrated story in medical entomology. And two, I'm going to end with um, a little bit of discussion on our project and what our goals should be for the semester. But before we begin, I'm going to show a lot of graphic content today. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I probably will try to give you a heads up before it happens, but I sometimes forget what the slide is, uh, what slide is coming up, and uh, we're going to see some awful stuff. Um, like this, for example, maggots. Maggots are some of these uh, creepy crawlies that create a lot of uh, anxiety. <laughs> Not to me at all, for some reason. I remember when I was a kid, um, I had a job of taking care of my, taking care of my neighbor's cat. And uh, they had, you know, the canned meat for the cat. And I one day I forgot the can outside. And I came back a couple of days later and I just saw that it was just kind of, it was filled with maggots. And I thought that was uh, by far the coolest thing ever. I just remember like leaning down, putting my face up against the cup and then just looking at the maggot squirm. I did that for like hours. Probably not hours. <laughs> I remember doing it for a long time, enough that it, I remember it today of it being like a super weird thing that I did. And I did a lot of weird things when I was a kid, especially with bugs. Um, but yeah, but, um, and so the beginning uh, definition I want you guys to know is myasis. And myasis is just a catch all for many types of infections that uh, humans or domesticated animals or our pets get with flies and the flies may be doing two things one they may be eating decaying flesh or they may be eating flesh like living flesh and that's the fly we're going to talk about today eats living flesh uh, but let's spend a little time with those that uh, eat decaying flesh because it's kind of neat it's called facultative myosis when we have like a gangrenous injury and flies come in, they colonize the injury, they lay eggs, and the maggots uh, feed off the gangrenous tissue, which is like rotting dead tissue. And the uh, awesome part about it is, you know, we've kind of harnessed that into a therapy and intervention of uh, gang gangrenous tissue on humans, uh, especially with, say, for example, uh, diabetic patients. Uh, they have a uh, limited blood flow sometimes to cert to their feet or to their hands or some other region on their body. This creates like a little pocket of decaying tissue. Megatherapy comes in and removes the decaying tissue. And that's absolutely crucial for um, normal healing to facilitate the healing process because a gangrenous tissue has like fairly negative effects on your entire body. Your body is just stuck in a perpetual um, inflammation. You have bacteria flowing into your bloodstream. That's called sepsis, which can be terminal. I mean, it's like a, an awful thing to experience. And so the fastest treatment is to just remove the decaying tissue. And uh, one way in which we achieve that is with maggots. And so the debridement is what is uh, occurring here. The fly maggots are eating the dead tissue, clearing it out, allowing your body to heal. Um, and and the, the, the way this is, occurs is, you know, the doctors order these maggots. Uh, they come in little jars. The maggots are bred specifically for this. Um, 
the doctor puts a bunch of maggots, then you uh, cover up the injury, the maggots do the work, they eat out all the dead stuff. You only leave it for like a few days or maybe a week. You come back, you remove all the maggots, check out the injury if it needs more uh, work for it to be cleared. Yeah, you repeat the process, the maggots are thrown away, they never reach pupation. And, um, and there's two things that you get by having maggots uh, do the debridement is one, okay, they clear the necrotic tissue, which is the goal, uh, but two, they secrete um, antimicrobial compounds while they're feeding, and so you get some additional healing factor associated with using the maggots. Super cool stuff. Obligate myosis, on the other hand, oof, this is not a pleasant, pleasant thing to experience. These are maggots that actually eat living flesh. Okay, now you're probably thinking, uh, oh, um, botflies. Botflies are actually fairly benign compared to the flies that we're going to talk about today, which are screw worms. Botflies, you know, yes, they live under your skin and they develop this giant welt, uh, but they're not eating your flesh. Okay, what the botflies are doing is they're eating the pus that accumulates in an injury. Huh? That's super nasty. Am I right? Um, but screw flies, on your uh, other hand, the maggots are actually eating your meat. And they have a nasty, nasty reputation. They're found throughout the world. They have different names. The ones that we historically had in Florida are, were called a new worm screw flies. And Europe and um, Africa, you have old world, wor old world screw flies. They basically screw deep in your flesh. The species name for this fly, let me look it up here, um, it's called Hominivorax, which is Latin for man-eater. And if you ever heard of uh, Devil's Island, which was like this French penal colony in the 19th century, notorious for just being like an awful place to, to be, it got that name because, you know, if screw flies occurred on that island, all right, enough with the folklore of uh, screw flies. Let's jump into why we. I'm going to spend the whole lecture talking about these things um, by watching a video. Let's watch a video of, this is actually a uh, fairly graphic video. Uh, we're going to watch a video of a new, an old, an old world screw fly in Africa. Uh, this is the vulva of a cow that's infected with these screw flies, okay? So it's eating the tissue off the cow. I can't imagine the type of pain involved in that, but it's awful. Uh, if you got no money to treat it, a quick way to do it is to um, use diesel. And so what they're doing is they're gonna just blast the injury with a bunch of diesel. That's going to make the maggots freak out, right? Like nobody likes to get blasted in the face with like this kind of stuff and then they're gonna crawl out of the injury and so it's kind of like a quick and dirty way to <laughs> clear out a screw worm fly infection um here the farmer is gonna fish out the the maggots forget how long this is gonna take here we go he already pulled out all right so the maggots are like very active they move around a lot there we go all right so these things are going to die because they got ex <laughs> they got splashed with diesel but uh, that that excitement is a, an opportunity for the farmer to pull it out i think that's it i think he fishes out more <laughs> from the cow vulva but that's enough of that okay but it, historically right for humans Anywhere where the epidermis is thin, it's an opportunity for a screw worm to take hold. And so what happens is the female flies by, she lays a bunch of eggs, and the eggs hatch and they burrow into the skin, and then they start burrowing into the actual muscle tissue. Um, and, but, but the barrier, like a thick epidermis, is going to prevent the screw worm infection. So this is where we get 
infections in them, nose, mouth, eyes, scrotum, vagina region, all places where the tissue is fairly thin and, per, and it provides an opportunity for the screw flies to colonize. Right, this is called traumatic myosis. When, um, when wounds are infected by screw flies, again, it's opportunistic. So your cattle are walking around in a field, they get scratched by barbed wire. That makes it super easy for screw flies to colonize the injury uh, because now it doesn't have the thick epidermis, the thick fur to worry about uh, the maggots burrowing into. It just already has a ready-made injury. And historically for humans, um, this has also meant umbilical myosis, umbilical traumatic myosis, where uh, we're born with an injury, right? Your umbilical cord gets cut. Um, eventually it uh, dries up and rots off and falls off. But that, those, that first week, yeah, you are susceptible to screw fly infections and I think before um, screw flies were eradicated in Florida, it was a source of mortality in humans, in infants, is that, you know, they would get their umbilical infected by these maggots and then they would get eaten. I mean, can you think of a more awful thing to experience in terms of like fly infections? <laughs> Research has shown that sheep and cattle can also be struck without the aid of a wound. The vulva and rectum of all animals are common sites for attack, together with the ears and navel of the newborn. Many documented strikes in Papua New Guinea have occurred in humans, with the fly penetrating the soft tissues the of the eye, ear, fly. nose and navel. Any wounds caused by accident or surgical means predispose all warm-blooded animals to screwworm strike. Essential husbandry practices such as dehorning and castration provide ideal wounds for attack. Just injuries. Okay, so let's talk about the history in uh, South America and North America of screw flies and how it uh, kind of began and followed really the, um, the just the broad cattle rearing and cattle ranches uh, development in the Americas. Because with cattle, you just have like big, basically for screw flies, giant piles of meat that they could feed off. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. Um, and, and then we have just cattle all over the place. And so eventually what happened is uh, screw flies really started to blow up population wise in um, French Guiana, which, uh, Devil's Island is just like right across the uh, on an island right up across from Guiana. So like we already have historical evidence that of like a awful uh, penal colony being f exposed to screw flies. But then uh, when farmers started paying attention that their cattle were getting eaten by these flies, first real scientific records were like in the 1850s. Um, but by the 1950s, the uh, screw worms had migrated um, to Mexico, to Texas, and Florida. Florida's kind of in a weird position here because we are connected to the South Americas, not directly, but through the chains of islands of the Caribbeans and Cuba. And uh, these are just like, just think of them as like jumping stones uh, where things could just like, um, cross little bodies of water rather than uh, crossing an entire gulf and so um and so by the 1950s this was causing a tremendous economic impact i mean the taking care of cows that are infected is expensive especially if you have to treat them on an individual basis um there's high mortality associated with this stuff the yield Right, whether it's milk or beef, is uh, significantly impacted by the squirms. And so what happened in the 1950s, they were like, you know what, we are going to kick this thing in the keister. And so by 1951, research begins on eradicating the flies. And the story about this is absolutely remarkable and amazing. 
A closely related species of the old world screw worm fly has already scarred another part of the world. Last century, the fly killed so many newborn calves that cattle production in the southwest of the United States was brought to its knees. By the 1950s, losses amounted to $120 million per year. Eradication campaigns removed most infestations by 1966. But the pest still remains a threat to the United States and a major problem throughout Mexico, Central and Southern America and the Caribbean. And uh, now today, um, the um, screw fly populations, which were found again, like that video showed Florida, uh, Texas, Mexico, everything's been pushed down to the uh, Panama Colombian uh, border, um, where there is continuous ongoing war uh, with the screw flies. And the way they prevent the screw flies from increasing their population or uh, increasing their geographic range past that Panama, uh, Colombia, that little pinch of land is an insane, insane endeavor. <laughs> I mean, I just, I, it blows my mind what's happening every day at that region just to prevent the screw worms from coming back into uh, Mexico, uh, Texas, and Florida. Okay, so here's the history of the uh, screw worm eradication in the U.S. Uh, the way they did it is fairly clever. Uh, they use a uh, biocontrol technique called a sterile male um, approach, where uh, screw worms have a funny uh, mating biology where the females only mate once. She only receives a sperm once in her life. This is an opportunity for us because it means that if we could somehow interrupt that single mating, um, we could prevent population growth and range expansion. And the way we achieve this is we sterilized males. Basically, we grab a bunch of screwworm males, we blast them with radiation, we irradiate them, making them sterile, it, breaks, it destroys their chromosomes. And so those uh, sperm are unable to fertilize the eggs, but they still mate with the female. And the female, she's like, oof, I mated, I'm done, even though she's not going to create a viable batch of eggs. That's how we eradicated uh, the screw worm, is by um, tricking females to mate with sterile males. And so the uh, approach is where we just release a bunch of sterile males into the environment. They go off, they mate with the females in, in, in the occurring in the population. Females can't lay eggs anymore. And that basically interrupts population growth. So no offspring are generated and eventually the population declines while we continuously release sterile males. And you probably, uh, There's one. No, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Okay, so that seems straightforward. How do you scale this to a state or a country? I mean, you need to create a ton of sterile males. And, and much like many things in the 1950s, you know, they took it to the industrial level where males were created in a factory by the millions and then we would release millions and millions of these things uh, out in the wild. There's one way to eradicate the screw worm fly. You build a factory and produce sterile male flies by the millions. This is a factory in Mexico. The larvae are bred and grown to the pupil stage. Then they are irradiated, exposed to gamma radiation, which renders them sterile. The female screw worm fly only mates once, and if the population is swamped with these sterile males, then the chance of fertile eggs being laid is reduced. <laughs> 
Look at that. The this flies method are has eradicated the fly from the southern United States and they Mexico, some Caribbean islands, in. and most recently Libya. And in release. It worked. Okay, but in Florida, it wasn't quite like that. And, um, but let's go through this super neat history. I, and some of it's uh, associated with folklore in Florida with love bugs. You know, love bugs, they emerge en masse um, sometimes twice a year in Florida. And there's like um, weird mythology folklore associated with these bugs where they were like bred by the government, released by planes, helicopters, and now have just gone and run amok. Well, love bugs have always been around. They're endemic to their, the area. No science has occurred um, to create those massive populations. What happened is this, right? So that these stories of mass release of screw flies got somehow intertwined with these um, bivoltine emergences of um, love bugs. So you get uh, to create many, many males, you need to basically factories and quite a few flat factory, two fr major factories were created in Florida and Sabring, and I forget what the other city is. Basically, they had these giant warehouses that they converted into um, maggot producing factories and they would generate about 500 million maggots flies a week. And the diet of this is where it gets mega gross. I mean, these are flies that eat meat. And so to be able to produce 500 million flies a week, you need a ton of, well, you need more than a ton. You need a lot of meat. And so let's go, let's go through some of this diet that they used to create all these flies, right? So they would need 113 metric tons of meat. I, I don't understand these numbers. These are, they're too big for me to kind of wrap my head around. They just need a lot of meat to create all these flies. And it's expensive, meat's expensive. Like you can't, even if it's just like the lowest grade meat you could think of, it's still expensive. Okay, so what is the rearing diet of these uh, screw worm flies, right? So the first one that he tried was like a true meat, ground meat diet, which was mostly just ground horse meat, blood, and milk. And in 1950s, you might be surprised, but there were a ton of horses out there. Uh, North America, we don't eat horses. And so when a horse dies, it just like goes to the rendering factory. It just gets um, processed. Um, and so at some point for like three, four years, a lot of the horses in Florida, when they would die, they would get shipped to these factories to be ground up and be served as food for the, um, for these flies. And it's expensive. Okay. So it'd take a uh, dollar 53 per pan. So they would create these giant pans filled it with ground meat and then put uh, eggs on the pan. And then the maggots would eat that, right? Um, and so it's basically like you're creating hamburgers for the maggots. These, these white chunks in here are the fly eggs. Um, and so they transition to a hydroponic diet, which is even sounds even more gross, which is like dried blood, eggs, milk, water soaked in like nylon mats. You just imagine that sludge. It just sounds absolutely awful. It's cheaper. But it's labor intensive, right? You got to clean all that stuff up. You're left with the giant sludge, at least with the raw horse meat, you know, the maggots would eat that and you could throw that out. But the nylon and the cotton does not get eaten or, and so you got to take care of that stuff. So then the final diet is like a gelled diet, dry blood, egg, milk, and a gelling agent. It's cheap, easy to do. You could just like have a pump that sprays the food out into these pans. Um, it absorbs the gelling agent also absorbs some of the, the feces created by the maggots. And so in all, the level of grossness here is very nasty. 
I mean, I, I, I would, although to be honest, I would love to just kind of walk through this factory and just see this entire process uh, happen. Okay, so uh, what they do is they like they dump a bunch of this gelled processed meat into trays. Um, they put eggs on it. The maggots would grow. Okay, and then what maggots do, and you you'll see. I'm sure you've even seen this with some of the maggots in your trash. If your job is to take care of the trash, is um, once they get ready to pupate, once they get ready to mor metamorphose into flies, they crawl away from where they were eating to find a nice place to um, eat clothes, and um, and so they have this like natural migratory behavior, and so this is what would happen if you had a fly infection on you. Once the flies, once the maggots are done eating, they would jump out of the um, injury, find a place where they could uh, pupate. And so we take advantage of that too, because it means that um, the maggots will just naturally jump off these trays and you could catch them. And then, and then while they're in their pupil phase, right? They're just like a this little capsule where there's this huge uh, physiological transformation uh, converting the, the maggot into a fly, um, you take those pupa and then you blast them with radiation. You irradiate them, uh, sterilize them. Now you're probably asking, holy smokes, this is a lot of work. Um, on top of that, we're, the goal for the biocontrol is to release males. Here you basically have a mix of males and females. How do you, how do you just get the males? Well, the males mature more quickly. And so they're the first to jump off the pan. And so if you catch, so you basically, because of this like delay in development, uh, if you time it right, the whole process, you could basically catch most of the males before you start catching females. You don't want to start processing the females. You're just adding an extra cost to the entire uh, process. <clears throat> the eradication of the fly on a broad scale is extremely expensive. This American film shows one of the many factories set up to produce hundreds of millions of sterile flies per week as part of an eradication campaign called the Sterile Male Release Method. There's a sludge. Devised by the, the United States Department of Agriculture, the method involves artificially rearing flies through to maturity and then sterilizing them by exposure to a okay, source of radiation. Okay, and you see little maggots jumping off, right? They've sterile fed enough. Sterile male flies are the basis of this method. Many times they're Female screwworm flies they jump off mate the only once in their lifetime. You catch and when them, crossed with sterile males, they produce sort... infertile eggs. New techniques allow the males to be separated from females early in the rearing process, thereby halving the production costs involved, especially the cost of radiation. Release of sterile flies into the field is done by aircraft for maximum dispersal within a vast permanent boxes. barrier zone of 1.5 million square kilometers. I love it. And so how do you sterilize them? You use these these things called a Hussman canisters or a Hussman irradiators. And, and what you're doing is just like you fill up a jar <laughs> with a fly pupa and you, you sit them in this irradiator for a few minutes, which like, again, it destroys their chromosomes and makes the sperm totally, um, it destroys the fertility of the sperm. And, um, and apparently these canisters are still around. I think there's a museum somewhere in Florida. I, I meant to look that up, but I couldn't find it where you could have a look at uh, some of these uh, tools that were used, uh, you know, 70 years ago. Okay, so let's uh, let's sketch it out. The entire history of the eradication of Florida. Okay, so remember 1951 is when they started to uh, think more deeply about eradicating these things. And the history of it, I think is kind of also unusual. Uh, the scientists that came up with this eradication program was inspired by a lot of the um, 
nuclear experiments that were occurring in the late 40s and 50s. And they were like, well, maybe we could harness that radiation to uh, eradicate these flies. And so, um, and so the first experiment on whether or not this eradication program was effective occurred in Sanibel Island. And Saliban Island is uh, off the um, uh, west coast here of Florida. It's fairly isolated. It had its own population of screw flies. It's got a natural population of deer and uh, goats and other cattle, which were uh, screw fly infected. And so they would they experimented there. They released a bunch of uh, irradiated flies and see whether or not they uh, destroyed the screw fly population on that island. And Sanibel Island, uh, you know, to me, when I moved to Florida, it was like one of the first places I wanted to visit because it had a lot of uh, screening locations for a day of the dead, you know, that zombie movie. <laughs> that is not a random thing that I just uh, talked to you guys about. Um, and nonetheless, uh, let's continue. Okay, so the plan was to uh, stack the population of screw flies on the island with a bunch of um, sterilized males. Uh, on top of that, the males were marked with like a radioactive marker uh, just to keep track of how far they dispersed. Right? It wasn't really known what happened to these flies once you released them. And so they marked them with a radioactive compound and they set up a bunch of traps. They set up a bunch of traps on the main Florida land uh, by the coast to see if any of those irradiated flies that were released in Sanibel Island crossed the water, left the island, and made it onto the mainland. Right? These are all checks, checks that need to be made to properly evaluate whether or not you know releasing a bunch of flies does that mean that they just kind of like fly in random directions, or do they actually impact negatively the population? Um, it was very effective. Like within a month or two months, they had completely eradicated the screw flies from um, the island. And from that, they were just like, F it. Let's just like mass produce this stuff and release it in Florida. And so you had the Bifflo and Sabring factories that were built in the mid to late 50s. And 10 years later, the USDA declared screw worms totally eradicated from the Southwest United States. And Texas kept getting screw worm flies until Mexico eradicated uh, their flies in the 80s. Um, but in now again, um, there is that Colombia, Panama, little strip of land, which is like the main uh, barrier for, for preventing screw flies from um, getting back into uh, North America. And uh, that place right there is just continuously getting flies released um, every week. Every week. They're, st they're still doing this today. And in fact, in a, they are doing this also in um, Australia, super nervous for getting the uh, old world screw fly. And so they also have these elaborate uh, screw fly breeding, sterile male breeding programs in the uh, uh, those islands that connect Australia to uh, Asia, like um, all that, like there's New Guinea and there's like the, all that chain of islands, you know, they have these factories there that are doing the same, same thing here. Um, but even though this was an incredible success story that took about 30 years to eradicate screw flies from North America, five years ago, this is what happened. These are the reported occurrences of screw worm infections in domesticated animals in North America. And you can see Florida just blew up 2017, right? All those different colors are different kinds of animals uh, being infected by screw worms. In particular, deer, cattle, cats, dogs, all sorts of wild animals were just getting nailed by screw flies in Florida. But um, we no longer had the factories creating the screw flies. Um, 
and the USDA was like, okay, we need to eradicate this quickly. What do we do? Well, the sterile insect technique involves sterilizing these flies with radiation. The release of those sterile flies into the wild population such that when the released male flies mate with wild females, their eggs are infertile and do not hatch. This one is active right here. There are huge benefits, not only to the cattle industry, but in ways that have probably touched every American in ways that they don't realize. This is a, a very beneficial purpose. It's not saving one animal or one humankind. It's all humankind, all animals needed. And we feel very proud Right, so this here's a plan that happened five years ago in Florida when these flies started to reemerge and cause a lot of trouble again. Luckily, we still have those factories occurring um, in Panama, generating those flies. Right, this is just like an ongoing battle that they have um, until it gets eradicated in South America. is totally necessary to prevent the flies from migrating back into North America. And so they're already generating millions of flies a week. Uh, we could tap into that resource and uh, release them in Florida. And so here, here's what happened in Florida, which is absolutely amazing, okay? So by Octo October 2016, right, the USDA was like, holy smokes, we need to kick, kick this thing quickly before it starts getting really bad. And what happens is uh, along the Florida Keys, they create a bunch of checkpoints uh, to make sure that, you know, people weren't bringing infected animals into central uh, Florida, right? They're trying to keep uh, the screw worms in South Florida as much as possible. And so they really created a bunch of checkpoints to make sure that people weren't bring, bringing infected pets or infected cattle um, up north. Um, they had a bunch of uh, sent sentinel traps to try to uh, measure and document um, how quickly these things are migrating northward, right? And what, what you do is basically just throw a plate of liver out, right, in a cage, and the flies will be attracted to it and um, lay eggs on it. All sorts of flies will be attracted to it, of course, um, but an entomologist can distinguish these, these flies are fairly conspicuous. Um, and then they set up a bunch of... Um, release chambers along the Florida Keys um, where they would um, ship in those Panama reared screw flies and then release them continuously in the Florida Keys with the hopes of just like snuffing out the a growing population of screw, screw flies uh, in the area. Now you're probably asking yourself like how did the screw flies reestablish themselves in the Keys. Well, what you don't see on this end over here is, you know, the Keys just kind of flow into the Caribbean and Cuba. They, those islands are just stepping stones to the massive screw fly populations occurring in South America, right? So they, there's always an opportunity for these things to slowly jump from island to island until they hit the Keys. And so Copeg, which is the, um, name of the institute involved in generating all these uh, screw flies in Panama, <clears throat> which is funded by the USDA. Um, they shipped a bunch of maggots. They released the flies. They eventually released almost 200 million flies and it continued weekly for a full year. 
And then after a year, right? So it was first on their radar around October where they're like, okay, this is getting bad. We need to start kicking butt. Almost a full, more, a little more than a full year later, flies were totally eradicated from the Keys, right? So Florida safe again. We don't have no screw flies. We don't have to worry about our injuries getting infected by uh, these uh, flesh eating flies. All done in a year. I mean, do you remember hearing about this? five years ago, right? This just happens, right? This is what happens when uh, scientists, the government, and highly organized institutes are prepared to deal with um, emergences of nasty things. About 1,300 endangered deer live in the Florida Keys and nowhere else in the world. It is believed that the miniature deer have lived in this area for over 6,000 years. The establishment of the refuge 50 years ago allowed for protection and recovery of the precious species. But in the last two months alone, more than 130 deer, roughly 10% of the population, have died of screwworm. Now entomologists are working to figure out where the infestation came from. The eradication from the southern United States was completed in about 1966, 50 years ago. And so up until uh, this year, we've been free of screw fly. The U.S. Department of Agriculture set up a command center at the airport in Marathon, Florida to fight the infestation. Among their efforts, releasing tens of millions of sterilized flies from Panama into the area. The female only mates once in her lifetime. So if we release enough sterilized flies to try to ensure that that mating that takes place is just sterile male, then obviously no offspring are produced. The hope is that this mating will prevent the births of new squirrelworm larvae. The flies are being released through 25 ground release sites across Marathon and the infected zones. All right, there you go. There's the story of the screw fly in Florida. Um, the old world screw fly is still a problem in Asia, Southern Europe, Africa. Um, those have been way more difficult than the new world screw fly to manage. Um, mostly because it's expensive. I mean, the USDA spends, you know, I don't know how much it spends on this. Um, a year, I think it's about like 5 million a year to release those screw flies in Panama. But it's having like significant economic impact because if those screw flies were around, you know, we'd lose like a billion dollars of cattle. Um, yield a year, just cattle alone, right? Not to count all the problems we would have with our pets, with human mortality. And so it's a, even though it's expensive, it's a small expense in terms of like long-term um, repercussions uh, for humans and the economy. The thing is like other countries don't have that money to throw around. And so that's why these things persist is they're expensive to manage. And so there'll probably never really be full eradication in South America. That would take, that would take uh, the development of many more factories, which again, just to emphasize the point, economically, it would be absolutely amazing to do. Um, the benefits of that are amazing. It's just that that's barrier of, uh, generating those factories and getting money to create those flies and sterilizing them. It's, it's a small expense, but you know, sometimes just the small expenses are, are uh, difficult to overcome when, when you have other troubles going on in a, in a country. Okay. So that's it. I've talked way too long about this uh, screw flies. I love these things. I have a few uh, specimens if you want to have a look at these things. These specimens were actually uh, collected uh, 60 years ago um, in Florida uh, before they were eradicated. Uh, they look really beaten up. <laughs> and so if you would look at them, you'd just be like, this just looks like a fly. No, they're a slightly bigger than a regular housefly. Uh, but it's not anything you need to worry about, right? Because, you know, scientists and USDA are on top of it. To the point where we don't even 
it's not even on our radars that they're eradicating these things in Florida. Like I was here, I didn't never heard of it until 2016. And then in a blink of an eye, they was already all eradicated. Okay, so um, if you haven't done so, make sure you fill in the first day attendance thing. I'm gonna to have to check that this afternoon. I don't want you to drop you from the course. So at minimum, just do that, please. All right, I'll see you guys next week. Take it easy.